Good afternoon. I'm Jim Eskin, founder of Eskin Fundraising Trading, and it's my pleasure to welcome to uh, welcome you to Eskin Fundraising Training's uh, nonprofit empowerment webinar series. This is our hundred and thirteenth webinar, and uh, it's our inaugural twenty twenty four episode. And we decided to begin with a big bang. In our virtual learning community, we have the entire family of the nonprofit sector, and that includes CEOs, executive directors, directors of development, uh, other staff, board members, volunteers, donors, and other friends in nonprofits from all across the country. Uh, by the way, let me first say we appreciate your commitment and your passion and your devotion to your noble causes that touch, improve, and save more lives. Um, you're encouraged to join us and share questions and comments one of three ways. You can type in the chat space, you can type in the Q&A box, or you can raise your hand and our producer, John Largent, will bring you on camera and give you video and audio uh, privileges. Uh, this is the format for today's program. I have a series of questions for asking our subject matter expert, but at any time our learning community can enter the discussion if they need clarification or how they have a question or comment of, of their own to raise. Now about the halfway point through the discussion, we will call on the newest uh, member of the Eskin Fundraising training team, Randall Luna, a nonprofit professional based in Austin and a regional coach with the Institute for Philanthropic Excellence to share some questions and observations. Randall will give you a whole 30 seconds at the outset here. Um, could you take 30 seconds and tell us about the Institute for Philanthropic Excellence? Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. It's it's nice to be here. I appreciate it very much. So the Institute is a, we're a national consulting firm dedicated to empowering nonprofits, especially smaller to mid-sized organizations. A lot of the time as they're embarking on their first, you know, major capital campaigns. So our mission driven approach means we're not just the experts giving the advice. We really partner with the organization, embrace their values and use our team's expertise to make a positive impact. Thank you, and we'll be bringing you into our spirited discussion. Now I have a daunting task. How in the world do you introduce our guest speaker, who is nothing less than a force of nature? Jimmy LaRose keenly understands that truth tellers don't win popularity contests. As an entrepreneur, author, fundraiser, speaker, he told me he has given 17,000 presentations, and for a little perspective, more men have walked the moon than have given 17,000 presentations, and he is the co-founder of Nano, and I'll, I'll, I'll uh, spell that out, National Association of Nonprofit Organizations and Executives. He has raised hundreds of millions of dollars around the world. And the title of his best-selling book, Reimagining Philanthropy, says it all. He is on a relentless mission to empower nonprofits um, and staff and board members, volunteers, especially donors, to achieve the maximum returns on the investment of their time, talent, and treasure. I feel very fortunate to call him a source of inspiration a mentor, and most importantly of all, a friend. Uh, but I have to tell you, sharing the virtual stage with him, someone who's given 17,000 presentations, I kind of feel like the warm-up act for Elvis. So Jimmy is based in Columbia, South Carolina. He's joining us today from Richmond, Virginia. First things first, Jimmy, How is the? thank you so much for joining us. And how is La the LaRose family doing? Thank you for asking, Jim. Over these last seven years, you and I having spent some time together, I'm agreeing to disagree at different moments. And I'd say 90% of the time, 
finding ourselves with shared values and of the same mind, which is the high call it is for people to lead and spend their vocational time in the nonprofit sector. The fact that people give their life to this space, like your audience, like our new friend Luna, and of course you is just something that is, enables me to get up every morning. Well, that's great. Hey, Jimmy, before we start, I have a lot of questions for you, okay? Good. And the audience can come in at any time. But I always like to take the temperature of the audience first. And so I would ask you in this time to type in the Q and the chat space. Type, I'm speaking to our audience. Type into the chat space uh, three responses. The first statement is, we are satisfied with the current state of philanthropy. And you can type in, agree disagree or no opinion you are we are satisfied with the current state of philanthropy agree disagree no opinion um second question we are open to imagining radical changes to the current state of philanthropy and type in agree disagree or no opinion okay and finally, this one you're just going to be type in a few words. It'll be a little longer. What do you want to learn most over the next hour? Okay. Type in a few words. What do you want to learn most over the next hour? I have a lot of questions with Randa ready for Jimmy, but um, we'll make sure if we don't cover them, we'll cover your questions. Okay. And um, Jimmy, what do you say? You ready to start? Let's go ahead. I'm going to stop with a real tough question, okay? Okay. You know, uh, on a personal level, I call myself Jim after first being called Jimmy and then James when I was in trouble. How long have you been called Jimmy? Jim, this is a bit of a personal question. It's a bit of an existential question, and it goes to my career. I was 18 years old when... I was invited to join Joe Ran Joy Ranch Home for Children as their yeah. director of development. I stayed there for two years, and in two years, my boss hired me a consultant because yeah. we were going to do a capital campaign. <laughs> Why not? And everybody Why not? told us we had to do a feasibility study if we were going to do a capital <laughs> campaign. And my consultant was making six hundred dollars a day. And I was making a hundred. Hey, what year? What year week. was this? What year was this? Nineteen ninety. Six hundred dollars a day was worth something then, right? Thank you. I was making one hundred and twenty dollars a week, yeah, plus room and board to be the director of development. And do you remember my consultant came in? It was this old craft accordion envelope with a string, yeah, yeah. and he had photostatted copies in it. Yeah. And but before a year was over, I had gotten a copy of every one of his copies. I went ah. to my boss. And I said, Rick, I want to become a consultant. He yeah. said, you have no business becoming a consultant. You're 21 years old. He said, but if you can find one nonprofit that knows less than you do ah. about fundraising, I'll let you serve. Yeah. Well, it took a year or two. I got an, a, a letter, a newsletter from another children's home. It was yeah. typed on an IBM Selectric. I took yeah. it to my boss. My boss told me I can serve. The first thing I did and went and did was sell them a feasibility study. Yeah. And it didn't work. Ah. And then my next client came along and I sold them a feasibility study knowing it wasn't going to work. Yeah. And I had an existential crisis. Yeah. And I, and I had to get some help because I had defrauded the nonprofit sector by yeah. selling a nonprofit a product that they couldn't use. And I took a five-year journey. And on the other side of that, I yeah. stopped calling myself Jim LaRose. I rebranded myself Jimmy LaRose as a matter of my transformation. Hmm. I would have never guessed that. Okay. Okay. Let's move on. We got really important stuff out of the way now. Thank you. Uh, in one way or another, you've been part of philanthropy for most of your adult life. What are the most significant changes you have observed and what hasn't changed? The most significant changes that I have observed is 
that now with 50 years worth of data, yeah. 50 years worth of data, we allow the nonprofit sector to live in failed metrics out of piety, and we support nonprofits and not achieving scale. But, by the way, if you want to run a food bank out of the back of your minivan, God bless you. I guess right. we need those saints. But if you're actually serious about solving a problem completely, what I am struck with after 50 years of it not working, how our structures are set up to ensure that the nonprofit sector never works. Mm. And, I, and I, have, I have figured out why by spending $2 million on studies, and I look forward to talking about it in an hour today. Good, good. Okay, along with Lewis Fawcett, who's kind of like a soul brother to you or kindred spirit, you established Nano. Could you take a few minutes to share some of Nano's proudest accomplishments? Well, thank you. Um, friends, in my youth, I came up through the Association of Fundraising Professionals. Back in the day, it was the NSFRE. Yeah. Um, I was the darling of Chronicle of Philanthropy. I was the young person. I was the future and of AFP, CFRE. I was on the team that wrote the test questions for ah. CFRE. Ah. And after having gone through the last exam, I realized and asked myself, along with Jerry Panis and some of other of our leaders, I think we're examining people on concepts that are no longer re relevant. I said, I'm going to find out. I raised $2 million and I had Clemson University oversee a five-year empirical study to discover what has stopped working in the nonprofit sector, what will work forever in the nonprofit yeah. sector, and what is needs to be working in the nonprofit sector that we're not doing right now. What emerged was an 1,100-page treatise called wow. New Guidelines for Nonprofits. So our greatest achievement was, first of all, coming up with this New Guidelines for Nonprofits, taking it to AFP, and AFP summarily rejecting it, taking yeah. it to CFRE, CFRE summarily rejecting it, taking it all to the state associations, letting them know all the good news. Yeah. And what we discovered was, what we discovered was, we were talking about products that no longer should be sold, and we were messing with the establishment's money. Jim, we didn't want to start Nano. Didn't want to start it. But in order, because we wanted to give new guidelines to all of the industry leaders, and instead, we had to form the National Association of Nonprofit Organizations and Executives so we could disseminate the truth about the things that are corrupt in our existing nonprofit sector and the things that we mm -hmm. aren't doing that we must be doing. And I have found corruption, and I don't mind sharing about it. Well, I'll tell you what. We're going to unpack some of your findings in our, our questions as we proceed. Everyone will agree that you are absolutely fearless about challenging conventional thinking. One of your most controversial positions is money is more important than mission. Money is more important than mission. I got to tell you, that sounds cold. Could you please explain how you came to that conclusion? Thank you. Because what new guidelines revealed is the same free market enterprise principles that we know work in the for-profit sector, we have taken them and given them and applied them in hundreds of nonprofits, even over a thousand, and we have proven that money is more important than mission. Allow me to defend this position. Okay. Eight years ago, I was told that I had the flu. I didn't have yeah. the flu. I was told that I had bronchitis. I didn't have bronchitis. They said that I had pneumonia. I didn't have pneumonia. Yeah. And when they discovered that I had contracted Legionnaire's disease, mm. I had slipped into a coma because 90% of my lung capacity was gone. It was full oh, of infection. God. I only had 10% lung function. And when you don't have the air that you need, your blood pressure drops. Mine dropped to 50 over 30. Mm. So oh my, my blood supply was no longer getting out to my vital organs. My first one to shut down with my kidneys. And I went into septic shock and I went into a coma for 19 days. Ouch. Friends, money is oxygen. 
And unless you believe that about your nonprofit, that money is more important than mission. Now, like I said, if you want to run a food bank out of the back of your minivan, God bless you. But if you want to solve a problem completely, you have to prioritize cash acquisition higher than you do the individuals that you serve. Hmm. Because if you will, what is the number one indicator of a nonprofit's ability to scale its mission? It's capacity to add staff. Yeah. Tragically, Jim, and I'll, I'll turn it back over to you with this one example. We treat donors like ATM machines that are outside the organization. And we've got this magic PIN number. We, and by the way, we shouldn't have to go to them. We are doing yeah. the better work. We should be giving the money. But we have to go out to this ATM machine, put in this magic PIN number we call a golf tournament or a silent auction. Yeah or a yeah. gala, yeah. then we get to extract X amount of dollars. And by the way, what is the role of any special event? To extract as many dollars as possible without yeah. being in relationship with anybody. Mm -hmm. Then after we extract those dollars, we go back to doing the more important work. And it's upside down. If we want to scale our mission, we have to prioritize cash over program. And it's even worse. It's not that money is more important than mission. Donors are more important than clients, people, or cause. Mm. And let me just support that, and then I'll turn it over to you. So people ask me, Jimmy, how can you say that donors, see, nonprofits mistakenly think that the rainforest, that yeah. the, the, the student, the family are their customers, and they're not their customers. Jim, ask me why they're not their customers. Mm -hmm. They're wow, not their customers because they ain't got no money. <laughs> your clients, your issues, your cause yeah. are not your customers. So what we're doing is we're actually writing mission statements that disclude donors. We're writing mission statements that attract more non-paying customers. Yeah. That we have to prioritize cash acquisition in order to hire 100 times more people to solve problems completely. Nano is also known for fiercely advocating that board members should be paid for their service. Tell us how that plays out. How much should board members be paid? What are the expectations for their board service? Are they still expected to make financial contributions themselves? Jim, for your audience, let me just share. Friends, if you go back and you try to pay your board, you'll get fired. Okay, so let's just agree that you're not going to do that. Okay. But okay. let me tell you what happens when I work with nonprofits and I pay my board members. The first thing is, working group theory says, any working group that is more than five to seven people is no longer a group that works. So, we through governance and bylaws and an ad hoc trusted committee that you serve on, you eliminate board position after board position after yeah. board position. And you bring it down to seven experts, a business expert, a nonprofit expert, a personnel expert, a, a, a financial expert, a legal expert, a communications expert. And you make sure that you put the rock star person in that position. Yeah. Number one. Number two, I pay my nano board members $1,000 a day plus travel for in-person meetings and $300 an hour for teleconference or virtual meetings. Okay. And friends, it's honorariums. It costs me $25,000 a year to provide my board members honorariums. Okay. To, to pay them. Furthermore, are you going to ask me about board members and fundraising? Because you asked me about board members and giving. I want to talk about board members and giving, but I want to talk it. We're going to get to that in a moment, okay? Okay. Okay. By the way, you pay them. You talk. What do you get back for that investment? First of all, nobody ever misses a board meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Classic Jimmy Rose. Yeah. Second, yeah. maybe you can't pay your board members. Yeah. But watch this. If you did pay your board members, which ones would you keep? Yeah. And if you ask yourself that question and you say, oh, 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 then yeah. why are they serving on your board? And by the way, who should be the chair of the nominations committee of the board? Who should be the chair? The CEO. 
because it's the CEO that stuck working with the board yeah. members. Yeah. That gets us right to the next question. You also champion the role of the powerful CEO. Could you explain more deeply what does that mean? What should the CEO be empowered to do on his or her own? And what types of checks and balances should there be on the power of the CEO? Friends, I could become your executive director or CEO and bamboozle your board for years. The yeah. current state of the nonprofit sector is board members rely on the president's report. It's just baloney. So stay with me on this. Yeah. The strong CEO is contrasted by the right type of board. I told you the positions, but I didn't tell you their function. The function is in between board meetings, they give advice. Yeah. You ask me what I get, Jim, in return for those honor honorariums. My attorney doesn't charge me seven hundred dollars an hour. Yeah. My 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 finance treasurer doesn't charge me four hundred dollars an hour. So in between board meetings, I receive advice. But well, you're, you're, board, it sounds like you're getting wisdom on demand. Wisdom on demand. The best wisdom on demand. And I'm putting people in positions that they love to be in. So it's involuntary. They can't wait for me to call because yeah. I've got them in the space that they love to express themselves. But that's the advice function in between board meetings. At board meetings, yeah. here is the framework. Friends, it is never about the board's vision. Please yeah. stop doing strategic planning and SWOT analysis. The <laughs> board is there for only one purpose. Yeah. Continuum. CEOs may come and go every seven yeah. or 10 years. So the board is there for continuum. The board is also there to keep the, the CEO with the, within the yellow lines of mission. But when it comes to vision, you hire a CEO that'll take your breath away with the vision that they bring to the board that scales the organization, yeah. that yeah. solves the problem completely. And then, this is huge, Jim. Yeah. The board relies on two outside third parties yeah. to evaluate the CEO, a financial audit annually and an impact audit every two years. Our model right now allows CEOs to self-report. Yeah. And what is a CEO going to do? Tell the board what a bad job they're doing? No. Each year, you rely on a third party to evaluate the CEO's financial stewardship. Every two years, you do an impact audit, and you find out if the vision that the CEO deployed is actually being accomplished. Yeah. Okay. I promised you that we would get back to this question. Randa Luna, get ready. Um, I bring I might bring you in. Uh, Jimmy, you questioned the role that board members can play in fundraising. Again, let's dig in a little more deeply. What do you mean by that? In which what can board members do and what can't they do when it comes to developing resources? Okay, is it I'm gonna need about a minute and a half to make We'll my give you that. Here. Well, I'll give you even two minutes. How's that? Okay. Friends, I have proven empirically with university-led studies that insisting that your board members fundraise is like trying to teach a pig to sing. Um, yeah. You irritate the pig and you get no notes. Yeah. Now, I am not suggesting that in the days of DuPont, Rockefeller, um, Stetson, I mean, what what we the mistake we made was we took the board model. Uh, in, in, in private companies and we oppose it on the nonprofit sector. Yeah. But there's no motivation for nonprofit members to actually be in their um, accountability function or their advice function. Now let's get to fundraising. Yeah, Friends, if you are sued, opposing counsel is going to first take your bylaws, which you were allowed to write any way you wanted, and demonstrate the number of ways you are in no way, shape, or form following and breaking your own rules. Yeah. So... Strip your bylaws of all this committee work. <laughs> Strip your bylaws of all these meetings. The yeah. less meetings, the less trouble. Now, right. when it comes to fundraising, here's what we do. We go up to John on the golf course. John, you're a great guy. We know yeah. that you'd have something off the board. It'll be 10 hours a month. That's 120 hours a year. I'll join the board. What we forgot to tell John is that in order to be on the board, he has to pay. 
Because right. we have to have 100% board giving. <laughs> how trite, how silly, how idiotic. Now, yeah. not only does he have to pay to be on the board. I had to say, and how universal, too. <laughs> and how universal. Not only does he have to pay to be on the board, but we forgot to tell him, oh, you have to fundraise. Now, yeah. John, you're never going to be good at fundraising. You <laughs> don't want to fundraise. And now yeah. we're going to persecute you for the next two years <laughs> because you're not going to fundraise. Friends, strip the fundraising responsibility out of the board responsibility. Okay, but Create a campaign cabinet. Create yeah. a campaign cabinet. Comprehensive campaign cabinet. Let board members serve on it if they want. On, but do not make fundraising a function of nonprofit board management. Okay, I want to go a little deeper. And Randley will be ready to come in. She knows the toughest fundraising of all in the performing arts. Oh, yeah. um, I think there's too much emphasis on the ask. You know, you have to uh, discover your prospects. You have to cultivate them. If you don't cultivate them, I don't care if it's Jimmy LaRose or Jim Eskin or you know, or whoever, you know, uh, the man on the moon to ask, um, is it appropriate for board members to identify prospects and to cultivate them and to thank them? Let's forget about okay. the asking. Remember, remember what my board model is. I want advice and I want accountability. Yeah. Now, if one of those seven people and if all of them want to be ambassadors, if they want to be champions, and because of the way I treat them and pay them, they tell everybody about Nano. It all works out wonderfully, organically, um, naturally. But I do not look to my board of directors for any function other than advice and, and accountability. And because I don't look to them for any of that function, I get it tenfold. But in other words, they are breaking the ice to their personal and profession professional and civic circles because they're so excited about their nonprofit. Jim, I, I got to let you know how okay. I do it. Okay. If I want a person to formally bring their network to bear, I take that board member and I put them on the campaign cabinet. That okay. is a function of the cabinet. And if a person doesn't want to serve on the campaign cabinet, they're so priceless to me as a board member. There is no responsibility that they have. However, there is a place for my group of volunteer fundraisers, for board members to serve if they choose so, to do those functions. Yeah. Uh, Randa, you have worked uh, for three different opera companies in the state of Texas. I don't know what could be a more uphill battle than that. Um, God, probably in one borough, uh, Jimmy, there were more than three opera companies. But what's your perspective on the board members' role in fundraising? Well, I mean, in opera, we, we needed them. You know, the board members were a huge uh, base of, like, our, our contributions. Our, our annual board donations were a big deal. Um, and it was incredibly helpful to have them on board, <laughs> on the board, to give those donations, but also to join, like, the fundraising committee, the, the gala committee, the everything else committee, the multiple committees that we had that, like you said earlier, five to seven people is about is that it. Yeah. yeah. Multiple committees with 10 to 12 people and trying to manage all that and mitigate the challenges. Um, you know, they they did choose to serve on those committees, but we also did. We treated them like they were kind of fundraisers. I mean, we they were ambassadors and representatives, but we did also ask them to help a lot. Yeah. Uh Jimmy, I guess this is where we agree to disagree. Another philosophy is the three G's, and that is for board members to give, get, or get off. Right. You know, I, I don't think with Miss Luna that I that I actually disagree. I would if we were if we weren't in public, I would ask her if every one of those board members that were fundraising also provided an expert function and also had the capacity to fire the CEO based on annual audits that are both financial. And I, I feel as though what she created there was a great community social group. Yeah. And thank goodness the CEO wasn't corrupt. Um, we and, and she created, and by the way, the passion for the arts 
And by the way, guys, don't kid yourself. Opera is an aphrodisiac. It does yeah. not get any better than the opera. Yeah. So I am not going to dispute the community that Luna created around around the, that art form. Yeah. Um, I will say it's uh, people are a bit more passionate. I just talked about aphrodisiac. Um, it's a special group of people that connect together because they love that art form and are willing to do just about anything um in order for it to succeed locally okay jimmy you know um the united states has more than 1.5 million nonprofits, many of which occupy similar if not identical mission space if we can't reduce the number of nonprofits. What can we do to slow down the creation of new organizations? I'm Jimmy LaRose, and I'm going to ask you to read these two books to find out that I'm not, when I answer Jim's question, that the answers are here. This is reimagining philanthropy. This is reimagining nonprofits. You just put in reimagining nonprofits or reimagining philanthropy into Google, and you'll see the data that backs me up. I think, Jim, there is a lot of red herring data out there. Yeah. There are 1.48 million nonprofits, but write down this number, friends. Yeah. There's only 300,000 nonprofits in the United States with budgets of $500,000 or more. Mm. There is no competition, and yeah. we need more nonprofits. We yeah. absolutely need more nonprofits because the ones that we have are potholes, yeah. are useless. Yeah. At, at, at best, they're social clubs, and they are not achieving significant impact. If I had a nickel every time I go to a community and said, Jimmy, if you did you know that here in San Antonio, this is the highest per capita number of nonprofits in the nation? Yeah. Everybody tells me that everywhere I go. Yeah, I would argue in your town... There's seven to ten nonprofits doing it right. All the other ones are doing it wrong, and I'm not going to worry about them. I yeah. need 24 of my not 25 more nonprofits that are actually going to take on the problems and serve them in a way where they eliminate them. Jimmy, uh, my wife Andrea and I love cats. Okay, don't you think it'd be smarter for us if instead of beginning, you know, a new nonprofit? to see where there's an existing nonprofit that we can contribute our time, talent, and uh, treasure? As long as you're willing, my dear Jim, to figure out what the right cat nonprofit is and then go out of your way to deposition all the other cat nonprofits yeah. that are hurting your city. Yeah, yeah. And by the way, find one, but is there one that's doing it right? Yeah. And if there's not, start one and operate it correctly. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You know, we've been witnessing, Jimmy, a strong trend in which more and more of philanthropy's total income, I think $500 billion, is coming from fewer and fewer mega donors. Many experts say uh, this is a 90-10 split. It used to be 80-20, I think, when both of us had more hair or a different color hair, uh, in which 90% of the income comes from 10% of the donors. Do you see any dangers in this trend? Jim, I don't. I'm, because I'm all about major gifts. Yeah, I know. And I don't mind if it's 90-10 or 95-5. Yeah. As long as I'm getting, but here's the problem. Each year, guys, Giving USA comes out and we all pat ourselves on the back. <laughs> Last year, the United States was the most generous country in the world and gave $498 billion. It's baloney. You want to know why? Because there's $1.2 trillion available to us and we're not getting it. Yeah. Because they're running our nonprofits poorly, and we are not giving donors heroic missions of scale where they give us $1 billion. How yeah. many people on this call are receiving a billion-dollar gift? The reason we're not doing it is we're not giving donors a reason. Yeah. So I'm going where the money is. Yeah. Money is oxygen, right? 
<laughs> hey, on a related subject, what kinds of powers and decision-making authority should leadership donors who give these mega gifts be entitled to and what type of powers and decision-making authority should they be denied? They should have no power or decision-making authority. Repeat that. I don't think you were clear enough. Repeat that. <laughs> they should have no power or decision-making okay. authority. I give the Jimmy LaRose nonprofit in Columbia, South Carolina, a billion dollars. Okay, so what do I get? If our mission and our money chases after ideas, and there will always be generous people who will amply support your great dream when it's backed by a sound plan. Now, if the donor's values align with your values, then we agree for the transaction. Right. But if the donor's values do not align with your nonprofit's values, you bless and release them. You help right. them find a place where it works. But we do not let the tail wag the dog. We only take the gift if the CEO's vision approved by the board aligns with the donor's vision. And the donor says, now, I, I would like this change and this change. And we look at that and we say, oh, my gosh, that's actually better than we were thinking. Yeah. But as it relates to final decision-making power, well, I guess they have all of it because I'm not going to do what they say and they can keep their gift. You know, that sounds like courage okay hey let's bring in rune uh randa randa i think you got a question for our force of nature yeah i did thank you so much this has been a lot of fun um you're a lot of fun to listen to jimmy this is great um so i'd like to say rondaluna.com if you don't buy it i will <laughs> <laughs> okay i'm on it i'm on it no, is, thank you so much, though. Um, you know, you're known for having these bold stances, to put it lightly. <laughs> um, and I know that you you started your career uh, dedicated to ministry. Yeah, I think that that I think that's very unique, and it adds a whole lot of depth for me knowing that when I listen to you talk. So, but with that in mind, I'm curious about how you know. For those of us out here in the field, it, inevitably there's conflict that arises around these things. So, how do you? navigate that while you're trying to drive structural change um but but you've got to maintain positive relationships with these donors with your stakeholders with the people who who want to support you next question <laughs> <laughs> Rhonda, yeah, no miss luna i really i really do think do you mind if i actually take a minute and a half to answer that question thoroughly yes we're no, going to no. give you a whole two minutes we'll give you a whole two minutes <laughs> Oh, I, I want to be sensitive. Friends, um, I, it has been suggested that we live in the most divisive time in American history. Yeah. Let yeah. me share with you that we had a first civil war in 1776 on this continent. We had yeah. a second civil war in 1860 on this continent. We then went, when I was born, Lyndon B. Johnson was president. And in the 60s, President Kennedy, Dr. King, Malcolm X, yeah. Robert F. Kennedy was shot. There was an un, un, a misunderstood arguably awful war friends that was division yeah the, the ideological division that we're having right now friends is nothing compared to where we've been at the past and we're going to be okay now to answer ron you know that's by the way that's reassuring thank you jimmy it's all true we're going to look back over these eight 16 years and we're going to say wow yeah. that was fascinating but let me share this with you as fundraisers without compromising you decide what your worldview you decide what your worldview is. You always operate truthfully within your worldview, but it is our responsibility to be all things to all men. Some of you are saying, I would love to have Jimmy LaRose talk to my board. Yeah. Some of you are saying, I would never let Jimmy LaRose <laughs> anywhere near my board. And it's our responsibility as fundraisers to understand the person that we're working with, their personality, yeah. their values. And as long as we don't compromise, um, our own heart, seek to find a way to help them accomplish their goals. And wh where they, even if you disagree with them, they believe that you are their champion. And I think that that's our responsibility to donors. Now, Rhonda, I don't know what your question was, but there was an answer. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> you got it. You got it. I, I was looking for ideas on how to handle that, the potential for conflict that arises when you're working on structural change to the whole industry. But, you know, you've got donors who may not be ready for some of that. And let's agree to disagree. It is not a sin to disagree. You know, I think that's the most important thing. Right, Jimmy? Oh, if guys, you disagree you know. with Jimmy S for Jim Eskin, you're not my enemy. You're my and enemy. Jim, yeah. Jim, first of all, friends, I hold these big ideas in my hands loosely. And I would never hold them in my hands in a way where it would compromise a friendship with a fellow colleague of mine that is doing the greater work in the nonprofit sector. So, Jim, uh, yes, we, you and I disagree, but we're willing uh, to set aside our disagreements to do something that's more than the sum of our parts. Right, for a better world. Yes, sir. Hey, another trend that is alarming is the steady decline in the number of American households who make annual contributions to a charity of their choice. And uh, to back this up, approximately... Two-thirds of American households were donors in the year 2000, and according to the last Giving USA report, that now has dropped under a half. Um, Friends, do you we, do any, understand, we do, do you understand. Do you have any thoughts on how that trend can be reversed? I don't know if I want to reverse it, but I'll say this. Ah, okay, I'll why? This. Why? Why don't you want to reverse it? Well, because what happened was the IRS tax law changed in a way where that $25,000, um, oh, I can't, I'm, I'm so tired, Jim. Yeah. When you're filing your taxes, you get to write off a flat yeah. 25000 right? So tax law no longer is an incentive to the grassroots donor. Now, friends, the answer to Jim's question and the way it's only going to change is instead of going up to Mr. and Mrs. Donor, small family, medium family, yeah. middle income, income, large family, million family, instead of going to and say, listen, we're doing a good work. We're a good steward of your finances. You should give us a gift. Friends, those days are over. I want us to earn a person's gift and bring them a solution that is so unique. It takes their breath away that they're yeah. confronted. That we are not doing our job as fundraisers. Are you making a value proposition and offer to a person where they say to themselves, what happens to my family if I don't give to this? Mm. I may or may not. What happens? Are you, is the value proposition so compelling that you're bringing a point, a person to a point of moral clarity? So Jim, I want all the nonprofits that are doing badly to continue to do badly. And then I want to beat them by t by treating donors and meeting their needs. Mm. Mm. Okay. Hey, let's return to one of your favorite subjects, okay? Oh, you all espouse the advantage of nano versus CFRE credent credentialing. Could you explain why? Thank you for asking. <laughs> okay, friends. I already kind of cited earlier that CFRE is driven by sponsors that in order for them to make money, 99% of you will never benefit from a feasibility study. Yeah, but yeah. you will be, the only reason CFRE exists, oh, by the way, what is the chief end of CFRE and AFP? To give the consultants a place to shop for clients yeah, yeah. and customers. That is the chief end. When we came forward with new guidelines for nonprofits, we were sure everybody was going to be thrilled with what we discovered. We didn't realize Pollyannishly that we were messing with their money. Yeah. So your state associations, National Council of Nonprofit, Association of Fundraising Professionals, Certified Fundraising Executive, and please record this and send it to them, yeah. are adhering to broken systems. Yeah. PowerPoints from 1998 <laughs> that aren't relevant anymore. Yeah. Nano is credentialing certified nonprofit executive. That's meant to replace the standards of excellence credential. Certified nonprofit executive, certified development executive is meant to replace CFRE. 
Yeah. And certified nonprofit consultant is supposed to turn each one of you into an emissary where you are being paid to go share the nano message with as many people as possible so we can actually solve problems completely and not stumble around in failure. You know, it sort of uh, reminds me of the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different outcomes. And by the way, guys, all these organizations were noble yeah. when they started. It's it, But I promise you they're adhering to systems that stopped working in the mid-80s and they're still being purported. Yeah. I will also say that I am a big believer in capitalism. The number yeah. one humanitarian program on the planet is jobs. Yeah. If not for jobs, we would all be in the bread line. So, when you look at all the different ideological, which I'm not scared of, it's all going away. ESG, DEI, if you look at all your state associations, they're not teaching you to fundraise. They're not teaching you how to structure your nonprofit. They are trying to pay for past sins, forcing mm. all of this anti-racism structure instead of actually teaching you how to build capacity. And yeah. it's anti you raising money yeah yeah hey let's get to something that's very timely donor advised funds or dafs have emerged as the most dynamic components of american philanthropy i don't know approaching the hundred billion dollar level we can't keep up with it some accuse dafs as parking lots for the wealthy in which they get immediate tax deductions with no timelines to move their monies to charities. What's your position on DAFs? Friends, record this and send it to your community foundation. Okay. The number one goal of a community foundation CEO is to make sure that not one dollar they're overseeing ever gets into the field. <laughs> Repeat I that. Hey, hold it. Hold it. Repeat that again. The number one responsibility and job of a community foundation CEO is to ensure that none of the dollars that they're managing and overseeing in their foundation or trust actually get into the field to make a difference in a person's life. Mm. Friends, there is a group of people in your community. They're spending their money in a lot of different places, but these are the dynastic individuals of wealth. D yeah. Dynastic, dynast. Th these are the, this is the real wealth. And every year they have an option to give this amount of money to the government or give it to charity. Yeah. But we came up with a community foundation scam. Yeah. You can give it to a charity that's called the Donors Advice Fund, which is just another checking account in your portfolio. Yeah. And you can keep putting that in there. And by yeah. the way, you don't have to actually remove any money from a DAF. Yeah. Nothing has to come up. And by the way, it's $1.2 trillion right now, Jim that are in the community foundations. And every year the donor gets to keep their money by putting in their community foundation. And 15 years from now, if you're lucky, one of their children will want to start a nonprofit to discover the, the effect of space aliens on ants. So they give all that money to their kid. Yeah. Or even worse, wait for it, friends. Just had a lovely donor pass away on a Friday. On a Monday... All the unspent money in their DAF was swiped and put into the general fund of the community foundation. The community foundation is a scam. Please tape this and send it to everybody. Mm. Mm. Um, the fundraising profession is experiencing profound churning in which a nonprofit is lucky to keep a development officer for 18 months. What do you think nonprofits can do to more effectively retain fundraisers who hold such crucial relationships with donors? You know what's funny? I thought I was doing my PowerPoint deck. I didn't know I was going to be interrogated. I love you. So forgive, <laughs> me, forgive me for the way I, I opened up. I didn't know this was. Yeah, and by format. the way, I appreciate appreciate the way you have not taken the fifth on any occasion, friends. You've heard that the average time that it takes for a person to not give you a gift to a six-figure gift, I did this study, 
18 months. Now, it's not that you're not going to get gifts in between, but it takes 18 months for your organization to receive its first six-figure gift from a person that you just met this week. Yeah. We also know that the average lifespan, if you can grunt the word fundraising, you'll get fired, you'll, you'll get hired, and you've got 18 months of salary where you don't have to perform. Let me tell you, what the problem is in the nonprofit sector when it comes to the churn and the revolving door of directors yeah. of development. I'll tell you what it is, friends. The nonprofit has the wrong CEO. That's the problem. Don't yes, get upset. It at the and it's the wrong, it's not a powerful CEO, is it? Right. It's got the wrong CEO. It's not the fundraiser's fault that there's no performance metrics. I'll let you know you don't want to work for me. If I hire you within 120 days, I know if you're going to meet your goal 18 months from now because of my, of my cultivation point system that you, you boyfriends, if you work for me, you get to count the cost as to what it means to be a fundraiser before you take the position because you will be accountable. And the reason the churn is 18 months and yeah. it's over and over is because we have inadequate CEOs. Mm -hmm. Okay, your organizations and uh, there's major gifts. Ram this up. Uh, they're all your conferences. The Jimmy LaRose Learning Machine is prolific. And thank you. Your organizations rightly, you know, prioritize the discovery, cultivation, solicitation, and stewardship of major gifts. In your view, how important is ego gratification, such as putting their names on buildings, to securing major gifts, what the major gift donors really want from nonprofits? Friends, because I have raised thousands of six-figure gifts, you can trust me. Mm -hmm. I am the personal development officer to the stars. Every fourth quarter, I help them make decisions regarding their philanthropy. So when I tell you about the what the donor heart By is. By the way, do you got Taylor Swift in your uh, portfolio? <laughs> I'm big in my own you're mind. Working, you're working on that. that. Working on that, right? Mm -hmm. Friends, when a donor actually, first of all, wants to memorialize or honor a family name, it is yeah. generally one of two things. It is because of somebody that has gone before them that they want to love and honor, or they want to set a precedent for their dynastic children for their responsibility in, in yeah. philanthropy. I have not seen it one of avarice, consumption, and greed that a do <laughs> major donor wants to put their name on something. And now, unless it's a corporation, and I'm a yeah. big fan of a corporation giving me a million dollars if they can make two million back. Yeah, I, I appreciate that as well, by the way. But when it comes to the personal donor, I, I see only pure motives. And when I when I talk about the investor, it's just good business sense for Blue Cross Blue Shield to match every single donation yeah. their employees give because they get a return on that with morale. Wow. Um. Jim, we're in the closing minutes here of this rich discussion. And I'm going to warn you, when you do such a good job, guess what happens? You get asked back. We're going to have to have you come back. What advice do you have for people who either want to enter the fundraising profession or advance in the fundraising profession? Well, friends, you think I'm patronizing you right now. But right now, you're in a space that is trusted. Um, Jim Askin and I do not degree, disagree on very much. And by the way, nothing that I have said on this teleconference, this live webinar, has been endorsed by Jim Eskin. It is not endorsed by Jim Eskin. However, he may choose to use it as a discussion point um, for further discussion. So I don't want you to, I don't want you to hold Jim Eskin accountable. Uh, we want people to think. <laughs> Think how they Thank can you. best serve themselves and their organizations. Friends, trust me on this. One of the greatest minds in nonprofit management, Dr. Kathleen Robinson, just put yeah. her into Google, called me four years ago and said, I need you to subscribe to a newsletter mm -hmm. called Stratagems. Strata 
Jams from Jim Eskin, Eskin Fundraising. So if you want to find out the, the smooth path, the right path, the productive path, stay in this space with Jim Eskin. He won't let you down and I'll be right behind him. Thank you. And by the way, Dr. Robinson's another giant truth teller. Let's see if we can fit in these last two questions. Um, and they're kind of digging in deep. Um, you've already achieved so much over your remarkable career. Is there anything left on your bucket list? There is. There absolutely there is. Good, good. Fr friends, so bad. This is so bad what I'm gonna do right now. <laughs> I am the son of man and I am looking for my twelve disciples. Yeah. Friends, I want to reproduce myself and my peers. Yeah. I want to become best friends with Rhonda Luna. I want to become best friends with you. Come as my personal guest to any of our events. Find out if what you're hearing resonates with you because I am called to raise up that army that moves the needle. And Jim, I'm going to tell you how we did it. 20 years ago, we were at 2.2% of market share. Yeah. The nonprofit sector only had 2% of gross national product market share. We're now up to 5.5. Mm. I've got about 20 years less left and i intend to have us at 15 percent of gross national product to take it and to change and save lives and i can't do it without the next person standing with me amen okay this question's on the philosophical style if you could travel back in time and even the great jimmy larose can't do that but if you could what advice would you give your 21 year old self oh my gosh thank you for asking that question Oh my gosh, friends, we're all messed up as a box of hangers. <laughs> and I know that as you do your moral inventory, you are devastated by the different mistakes, the different situations that you found yourself in the past, the different ways that you stumbled, the different relationships. You didn't mean to break them, but you messed up and you broke them. And I want you to know it is okay. I want you to go back to your 21-year-old self and be merciful. Do mercy. You are great need meters. You're not going to be great need meters for the people in your community if you don't first meet your own needs and forgive yourself. Your past has brought you to this point. Don't listen to voices. No shame, no guilt, no toxicity. Be encouraged. Jimmy, we are, bring, we are, you know, spoiler alert, you're coming back. This has been one of the richest hours I've experienced in our 113 webinars. And thank you. Again, thank you for being a force of nature. Thank you for being Jimmy LaRose. Thank you for agreeing with me. Thank you for disagreeing with you. But thank you, most of all, for thinking with me and challenging me on how we can make this a better world. And we say that to our learning community audience. A few bookkeeping details. Uh, we're going to post on LinkedIn and Facebook. We have distilled Jimmy's wisdom into five bullet points. And that's going to be posted in a minute on LinkedIn and Facebook. And then our producer, John Largent, president of Game Day Media, who right now is in Orlando, uh, Florida. John, you've been with us since day one. Thank you for your contributions. Uh, he is going to do a spin dry cycle and give us a edited tape sometime uh, within the next 24 hours. And you, everyone in the audience and everyone on social media will have access to this, to the wisdom that's been shared with us. So uh, we resume our series on February 7th with the CEO of the Nonprofit Council on the topic of nonprofit collaboration. And uh, may I say, Jimmy, um, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if he followed this webinar. We need, okay, remember, I got the promise from Christy. You're coming back later in the year, okay? Jim, I count you as one of my dearest friends in this industry. Thanks for considering me today. Thank you. And tell you what, be well. Be well to my brother. learning community. Be well, and we'll see you in two weeks. Thank you so much, Jimmy. God bless.